Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci fi. If you love to read, this is the podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Hello and welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah. It's Friday. Uh, As I mentioned at the end of the last episode, we have two episodes this week, and so I'm happy to bring you another author interview. I hope your week has gone well. I hope uh, you have a... A good weekend planned. If you don't have to work, I hope you have something fun planned. Or, you know, if you're the type of person that really loves cleaning your house over the weekend, (laughs) I hope you have fun doing that. But if you're not the kind of person who loves cleaning your house over the weekend, I hope you um, find a good balance between getting things done that need to be done and uh, relaxing, resting, finding time to do something else. It has been beautiful here this week it is uh, it's like february 1st hit and just the weather changed it not that it was really cold ever um it's damp here in the winter which makes it feel colder sometimes sometimes it's colder inside than it is outside which is weird um my husband has been freezing all of january uh but i have not found it to be that horrible but february 1st hit and is just like i said been gorgeous it was it's been about 60 and this beautiful sun we've been taking the dogs for walks and we found this really nice little tiny beach it's not private but it feels private like there was we were the only people on it today and yesterday there was only one person on it uh, and it's just it's this teeny tiny beach it's down the steep set of stairs and so we've been taking the dogs and walking and getting some sunshine getting some exercise it's been really really nice and definitely helpful for the mental health with the sunshine and the exercise i am not complaining about that um at any rate hope your week like i said has been going well and that you've got something good going on this weekend um as i mentioned at the end of the last episode i'm speaking today with author linda hurtado bond uh, about her crime thriller all the broken girls she also writes under linda bond and she writes more romance in the, in the romance genre for that so with uh, since she was changing genre she and she explains this herself but um in case you've heard of linda bond this is the the same author she's just writing in a different genre so she is going by the three names linda hurtado bond and um the book as i said is all the broken girls let me give you the description of that book Crime reporter Mari Alvarez was never able to solve her mother's murder 10 years ago. But when a woman is gunned down on the doorstep of her West Tampa neighborhood, Mari can't shake the eerie sense of connection. Now there have been two murders in two days, each crime scene awash with arcane clues and without a trace of DNA from the killer. And for each victim, a doll. The first is missing an eye, the second is missing a heart. But are these clues leading to the killer? or messages for Mari. Caught up in a maelstrom of old world superstition, secrets, and ties to her own past, Mari has only one option. Put the puzzle together before someone else dies, even if it destroys her career. But there's no escaping the hungry spider's web when it's been made just for you. And so again, that is the description of All the Broken Girls. And it is, as I said, it's um, a crime thriller. Mari is a reporter, but she's working with a detective on this case who is investigating these murders, but it's, it gets very personal for her very quickly. And um, this takes place in Florida, in Tampa, in West Tampa. And uh, so uh, there's, there's a lot of things that I got to experience through this novel. One is... Um, 
a neighborhood that I am not familiar with. I've been to Florida once, haven't really spent a lot of time there. Um, so it's kind of fun to see this particular neighborhood through the eyes of Mari and the detective that she's working with, but also um, Mari's grandmother and Mari to a certain extent. She starts exploring it more in this novel, um, practice something called Santeria and Linda is going to explain that more than I'm not going to try. Um, I don't want to get things wrong, but it was really interesting for me to read about that. Um, something that I had heard of, but didn't really know anything about. And so, you know, I always love learning new things and um, learning new belief systems or religious systems, I think is always fascinating for me. So that was a draw for me, um, along with, of course, lots of twists and turns and the um, the, the development of Mari's character and the way her past is coming into play in this story, etc. So a lot of things to enjoy in this story. But let's go ahead and turn now to the interview with Linda so she can tell you more about the book and Mari and the writing of this. Um, there's going to be at least two, so maybe a series. But again, this one is called All the Broken Girls and the author is Linda Hurtado Bond. Let's get to that interview. Hi, Linda. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm happy to have you here uh, to talk about your book, All the Broken Girls. But before we do that, if you wouldn't mind um, starting by sharing a little bit about yourself, that would be wonderful. Of course. So I'm actually a journalist uh, by day, a television news reporter and an author by night. I guess I just always really love to write. You know, I've, I discovered that in high school and when I... Oh, got on the um, school newspaper. So I really actually started with journalism, but also in high school, you know, have, they have fine art schools that you can go to. And most people think you go for like dancing or theater or, or singing, but I actually went for creative writing. So half of my school day and in, in like my senior year was spent just learning to write poetry and um, learning to write different things. And so my love for writing has just been forever. I never really thought that I could make it make a living though as an author, funny enough. So when I decided to go to college, um, I went to the University of Georgia and studied journalism because it was kind of a combination of everything I loved it, starting with the writing. But I'm also kind of a current events junkie. And like I'm always watching the news anyway. Uh, I always like to be where the action is. And there is a little bit of performance art, I would say in television journalism because you're on TV. So, uh, you know, you have to be on, so to speak, as you would in the theater, although I don't consider it acting, but I do consider it um, a, basically somewhat of a performance. So uh, it was just kind of a combination of everything I loved. And then I spent the next years building my career as a journalist. So it wasn't until I got to Tampa, Florida, I was an anchor uh, for the ABC station in town that I thought, gosh, you know, I just really still love the thought of writing fiction. So I, I understood at this point that writing as a journalist and writing fiction are really completely different. So I, I decided to go kind of back to school and learn how to write fiction. So I joined the Tampa area romance writers because I started with romance and went to their meetings and I started going to uh, taking online courses and going to conventions and really studying the craft it took me you know, years to, to finally get an agent and then finally get a book published. But from that day forward, I was really writing uh, as Linda Hurtado, the journalist, and Linda Bond, the author. So I'm currently um, anchoring the noon four and five o'clock news Monday through Friday at the Fox station in Tampa. And I've um, written four books for Entangled Publishing, the last being All the Broken Girls, and it's a thriller. So that kind of gives you at least a little bit of my history. Um, I'm also a mother of five, and all the kids are now out of the house, but we have a doctor, a firefighter paramedic, um, a nurse, a pilot, and then my youngest is at the University of Florida, and she's studying psychology. So it's been a busy life. <laughs> yeah, I guess. And actually, I smiled when you said um, that more toward the beginning that you are a journalist by day and an author by night. It sounds like the beginning of a like a television show. <laughs> I would love that. That's a good concept. I yeah. wonder if um, Shonda's listening. <laughs> I'd love for her to do a her, do like some kind of series about that. But that's uh, really the backstory for all the broken girls obviously the characters are a reporter like I am. And so 
uh, that world is very familiar to me. Mm -hmm. And I also wanted to approach like a murder mystery from a different angle because uh, most of the time it's the detective solving the case. But in this case, it's a reporter and she's working with the detective, but she's the one who actually really solves the case. Um, so that was fun. Yeah. Was that your initial inspiration for the story was taking it from the, the reporter's um, point of view of solving the case? What was interesting with this book, Entangled, my uh, publisher came to me and said, because my first three books are really romantic suspense. So they fall into kind of like a James Bond movie category. You know, there's action and adventure and, you know, there's a, a love story and maybe, you know, one scene of romance. And um, but they came to me this time and said, we would like you to write a serial killer thriller. And they really kind of gave me some instructions. It has to be it can be a reporter, but she has to work with a detective, but she has to also be the one that solves the crime. We like the idea of a murder wall. And then I wanted it to be uh, culturally relevant because I met my husband uh, on a trip to Cuba when I was reporting many years ago, I think back in 1997, when Fidel Castro invited Pope John Paul II. And so I covered his family on that story. So I've always been in love with Cuba, love the Cuban culture. Now I've raised five kids in the Cuban American culture. So I threw in that element to the book and they were they were happy with that. So it's a serial killer thriller, but with a Cuban American theme. And was that a challenge with having that kind of specific instruction for what to write? Or did you like having, you know, them giving you more direction? Well, I like I liked them giving me directions. The only thing with when you agree to write a book for somebody is when they want you to tra change direction or change something you know, you really have to be open to that and change it. You know, if it's, you're just writing the book and then you're trying to sell it, you could, you could write whatever, but they had very specific goals in mind with this book. And so I, you know, I did have to, in fact, I had to kind of change the ending and in a murder mystery, when you change the ending, you're really basically changing threads throughout the book uh, because that just is with a whodunit that just happens. So I, I ended up taking five days off of work and just kind of hiding in a condo um, and, and writing like the back half of the book um, and not totally rewriting it, but, you know, re rewriting it or doing another revision in about five days. And that was at their request. And, you know, after you have a moment of panic and then, you know, I don't know, go for a walk and stomp around a little bit. It, if you and then you figure out um, the changes that will uh, make what they wanted to happen happen. You know, then it becomes fun, actually. It, it's a challenge, and um, but but it's a good challenge. And I do believe, at the end of the day, the book is better for the change they wanted at the end. I'm going to jump in here so we can take our first break of this episode. If you're anything like me, that story caused a little bit of anxiety. Um, and we're going to talk more about that when we come back. So just remember um, rewriting the ending and fixing what needed to be fixed because of rewriting the ending and anxiety. And that'll come into play when we come back from the break. Stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Golden State Media Concepts bring you the Bible Study Podcast. Reflect and journey the Bible as together we study God's Word and be inspired. Bible study made fun and informative for all ages. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Bible Study Podcast. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I am speaking today with author Linda Hurtado Bond about her novel, All the Broken Girls. As a reminder, before the break, she was talking about changing the ending, and so that's going to help make this next comment of mine and then her follow-up comments make more sense, just in case you needed a reminder of what was happening before the break. Well, that's good. I had a moment of panic for you when, because yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking of all the things that you have to make sure are still, you know, with continuity and everything yes. in terms of clues, that would be, yes. it could be very difficult. Luckily, I'm a television news reporter, and I have been for, gosh, almost 30 years. And 
if you know anything about TV, you know that the deadline's immediate, immediate, imme and now with social right. media, it's even more immediate. I mean, you're not writing for the five o'clock news, you're writing for the web now. Mm -hmm. So uh, I've learned to, to, you know, sit my behind in a chair and just get to it. So I think that did help a lot that uh, after the initial panic, I just sat in the chair and just did it, you know, just wrote it. Sure. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about um, Mari, the main character, and what about her you think might resonate with readers? Yeah. Um, Mari is, I wanted her to be, you know, tough and tenacious, as I think a lot of reporters are. And as I think if you ask my friends, they would probably tell you, I'm a little like that too. I can be, um, I can be kind of a bulldog. <laughs> and it's hard sometimes to make that kind of character likable. I mean, you could do the save the cat and, you know, have her pet a dog or kiss a baby and, you know, hope people like her after that. But what I wanted to show is that even the toughest of us have a very vulnerable side and we also have, you know, a past and a history um, that has shaped us into who we are today. I think that is universal, right? We, we all have vulnerabilities. We all have, uh, I don't know, secrets maybe or, or um, bad moments in your past that, that shape you in the future. So with Mari, it was that her mother was shot um, in their doorway at, at, in their house when she was home 10 years earlier. And the case is still an open case. And it kind of haunts her because she... Um, thinks that she knows who it is, uh, but the police, but this person was given an alibi and this is, you know, someone who's very powerful in the community. So she's always kind of believed that that person is still guilty. And so as a reporter, it's very hard to live 10 years with a, with a mystery unsolved, especially when it's the mystery involving your mother's death and you're a reporter and you're supposed to be a good one. And so that's kind of um, how the story opens is she uh, gets in trouble at work first and, um, for accusing a city council member of being a serial killer and based on very good sources. But again, not another powerful person in a position where they had power and um, it was never proven. And so she got suspended, luckily not fired. So she's kind of really in a very down place when the book opens and she's sent by her boss to go cover a, the birth of an animal at Bush gardens, which is like, you know, um, a super punishment in front of the the whole newsroom to be assigned to that kind of feature story. And on the way to the feature story, they hear on the scanners that there's been a murder and it's in her neighborhood. So can you imagine the PTSD that triggers in her? And she knows she's supposed to go to Bush Gardens, but they divert and they go to the crime scene. And at the crime scene, she sees two young girls that are about the same age that her and her sister were when her mother was killed. And this is when her vulnerability comes out really quickly in the book um, and how she, what she does, and I don't want to give it away, but what she does in that first scene or, or one of the first scenes to help these two young girls, I believe is that kind of save the cat moment. It shows that, uh, despite her tenacity and despite, you know, the fact that she just did what her boss tell her, told her not to do, <laughs> that she really is, you know, at heart a good person and, and really does want to help people. And so it was just important for me to have that kind of tough character, but give her these vulnerabilities that people can recognize and also have a goal that she has not been able to achieve and one that just um, kind of eats at who she is. And I think we can all relate to that, too. I mean, there's something that all of us feel like we failed at and it kind of haunts us. Yeah. And in that that first scene and again, we don't want to give too much away. It's always a little tricky with books like this, but right. um, we see she, she gives a bracelet uh, and that's the base, the most basic explanation I give to one of the girls. Can you talk a little bit right. more about the basis of she, she's not exactly a religious person, but she has grown up in a culture of religion. Can you talk a little bit more about that and how it, um, it works through her and the story? Sure. I'd love to, because um, you know, when you, whenever you tell someone that there's uh, religion in a book, a lot of people just go, ah, but uh, to me, there was no way to keep it out because in the Cuban American culture, you know, your, your religion is very important, whether you're Catholic or um, whether you follow maybe a, a different kind of, I, I hate to say, a religion. It's more prevalent in South Florida than it is where I live in Tampa, but Santa Maria is basically a religion that was formed in Cuba when um, slaves were brought over from 
Africa and kind of forced to practice the Catholic religion, but they didn't want to. They wanted to practice their religion. And so they kind of did that by assigning their their gods or orishas, as they're called, to Cuban saints. And so St. Barbara has a um, equivalent in their their African religion. But if you were to walk into, you know, their small room, you would see, you know, a statue of St. Barbara. You wouldn't see a statue of uh, the Orisha that, that, or the saint that they were worshiping. And so that mixture is what developed into Santeria. So in Mari's life, her grandmother practices that religion. And in a lot of Cuban American families, if you were to walk into the house, you'll see like an altar in the wall and you're not quite sure what it is. It's got Catholic saints in there and crosses and, um, it, and it's usually something put there by the older generation. So she kind of grew up knowing what it was because her grandmother practiced it. But her mother was, you know, very much a Catholic and buy the books and go to church and, you know, you know, that's witchcraft or voodoo. Don't, you know, don't practice that. So she's always had kind of this conflict, you know, going on between the religion. But one thing that is a part of the Cuban American culture and not necessarily a part of Santeria is the idea of the evil eye. Uh, I think that's so universal. And most religions around the world, you'll see uh, there is this concept of someone giving you the evil eye or um, wishing you ill will. Maybe it's intentional, maybe it's unintentional, like, oh, your baby's so beautiful. This from a woman who couldn't get pregnant. So while she means it, in her heart, there's envy. And so sometimes that envy um, can make you can make someone sick. It's like casting bad wishes on someone. So this this bracelet is supposed to and an, an amulet that you wear, a gemstone, is supposed to protect you from the ill will of others, whether it's um, intentional or unintentional. And so when Mari gives away this bracelet, her goal is is a good one. It's to protect these young girls because she knows what they're about to go through. She went through it herself. But by taking the bracelet off, she doesn't even realize it or think about it at the time. Um, she is taking away her protection. And whether you believe it or not, sometimes there's such power in, um, in, in just the, the belief of something, correct? So whether mm -hmm. you can prove it or not, if you believe it, then it's true to you. So it, it kind of talks a lot about that in the book too. Yeah, and um, the the one detective that she is working with is a good foil for her in that because they have some some very organic conversations about it that don't, you know, so you learn a little bit more about her belief system or not exactly belief system in her case. Right, she's right. Make it, not making it up, but you know what I mean? She's kind of feeling it out. Well, you know that whole, when you go, okay, I'm not sure that that's a real thing, but just mm -hmm. in case, you yeah. know? Yeah, but the, right. I thought that was, that was a good um, way to get about, you know, explaining the religion and how, what it means in her family and her life without making it, to explain me, if that makes sense. Well, thank you. That's a compliment. And I, and I also, also hope that you felt it was all just very factual, informational, delivered in a way that's very cultural. And it's not judgmental at all. It was not meant to be judgmental. Um, it's just a part of her life. So it is mm -hmm. what it is. It's a part yeah, of her exactly. Life. Exactly. So um, was that something that you researched for the book or what types of research did you do for the story? I did because this is the reporter in me coming out and I, you know, I, even though this is fiction, it's very important for me to be as authentic and as, as correct as possible because a lot of people that read my books as Linda Bond also know I'm, I'm a TV news reporter. So I have a problem with just making stuff up. Right. So I, even though um, I talked to many people in the Cuban American culture, uh, or in the neighborhood. Um, I also went to a professor at the University of South Florida whose expertise is Santeria and she's written on it and published things on it. And I asked her if she would read the book and if she would be my consultant and just basically make sure that of course it's factually correct and um, non-judgmental. I just really wanted it to be just a part of her life and nothing more. Uh, but correct. And so she read the whole book and, um, and, and loved it and was, was again, really pleased too, that we were teaching uh, uh, the reading audience about a different religion in a non-judgmental non way. Right. Because it can be, it can be very easy to cross that line into, Oh, yes. it's kind of making it seem kind of silly, you know, it, yes. one person's yeah. belief to another person might seem silly or superstitious. So right. yeah, I get that. Right. 
time for the second break of this episode. When we come back, Linda will be talking about character development um, and a little bit more about Mari. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and my interview with Linda Hurtado Bond. Yeah. Um, how about your characters? Do you have a really good idea of those characters before you start writing, or do you like to let them evolve as you write, or is it a combination for you? I, I really, you know, I when I first started writing, I just wrote. But now I really think it's important to write out the arcs of your characters because a really good book that draws me in, like the authors that draw me in, it's really all about the emotion of the person. You know, the story is there, but the the book is really about someone with a goal and the obstacles they have to overcome to get to that goal and the emotional arc and how they change as a person on the journey to achieve that goal. So um, I, I really... It doesn't mean it's not going to change, but I really would like to have that emotional arc figured out for all of my characters. And then I'm a big fan since I started in romance of enemies to lovers. So that trope um, and following along how two people who are adversaries in the beginning and at odds, how they all of a sudden end up falling in love, falling in love and how you can make that kind of feel authentic. And so uh, Again, if you have arcs, emotional arcs, the best way to do that is the emotional arc of one character should be, you know, in direct conflict with the emotional arc of the other. And that kind of sets up an authentic um, adversarial relationship in the beginning. And, you know, sometimes it's as easy as just, you know, you've got a detective who's trying to protect his crime scene and a reporter who's trying to get information about a crime that's committed and put it all over the evening news. And so, you know, her goal in that moment in the book is completely opposed and different to his goal at that moment in the book. And that's how they meet. Um, And so that kind of arc is good, too, when the goals of the two characters are opposite and and antagonistic um, in the beginning. So I usually start with that. I start with the characters, what their goal is, um, what their wound is. Uh, certainly, of course, with her, her wound is her mother was killed and she was never able to help get, see justice. That's really the theme of the book is, uh, is justice, um, does it matter how justice is served if it's deserved? But really justice is through the whole book. And she just wanted justice for her mother and her family for the murder of her mother. Uh, and that was her arc. And I had that before I even started writing anything. Mm-hmm. You've mentioned, um, you know, that you're a journalist, Mari is a journalist. So there's, there's that, the, the, the Cuban culture element. When you write, do you typically include autobiographical elements or was this more of an outlier for you? You know what? I try not to make it too like me and I try like not to make it too much like anybody I know. I mean, there's, see, there's such danger in that. Like when I first started writing, you could probably recognize the photographers in my books because they were very much like people that I knew, you know, and people that I worked with. And it was okay at that point because they're lovable characters. They're usually the the photographer and the sidekick. And so they're based on photographers that I really enjoyed working with and, and their unique characteristics. You know, I never made a villain somebody that I knew, right? 
but I did kind of take a um, different road one time trying to write a women's fiction book. And when I let some of my friends, and it was about four women. And when I let some of my friends read it, they were like aghast. <laughs> I was writing about them. And I said, well, I'm not writing about you. I, you know, I thought I changed the characters so much that nobody would ever know it's you. And, and so I think subconsciously, sometimes it does seep in, so, seep in. And so I just shelved that book because I don't ever really, really want to write about people I know. It's so personal and you don't really want to do that. So I'm learning as a writer, I'm learning as an author that um, you might take somebody's quirk or a unique characteristic or the fact that they're funny, but you really don't want, I don't think, to write a character that's close, too close to anybody you know, because um, I don't know, you don't want to hurt anybody's feelings or I don't know, give them a big head. I don't know. I just think <laughs> if you're a fiction writer, maybe it's better to stay away from that. So for instance, like the news director in this book is not based on my current news director. I mean, I'm smart enough to know not to write about my boss. Right. So um, yeah, there's just, there's just a line. I think you, you don't draw um, between the real world or there is a line you draw between the real world and your fiction world. And you make sure that, um, you know, they don't become one. Is that a, I guess that's a good way to say it. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Um, this is not your first book and you've mentioned writing others. Are there any other books that you want to highlight at this point or? Well, my favorite, I guess, besides this book that I just wrote was probably Alive at Five. It's the first book I wrote. So it was my first journey into the publishing industry. The first time I saw people reading, you know, a book I wrote. The first time I saw reviews from uh, people other than my friends, you know, so that was a very cool experience. And it was also really a fun book to write. And I, I came up with the idea, uh, sometimes, you know, my real, my real job and, and, and my night job kind of, I say my real job, my day job or my night job, um, I'll marry each other and it's it's just there's nothing I can do about it it happens and and th this was the case with my first book I was sitting on the desk anchoring about an adventure vacation and I turned around to my co-anchor Walt Makovorsky and I said oh wouldn't that be a really cool place to use as kind of a front for hire um you know murder by hire and he turns around and looks at me and he goes what? <laughs> Explain that. And I'm like, well, if you're on an adventure vacation, you're doing things that are inherently dangerous anyway. You're jumping out of planes, you're skydiving, you're swimming with the sharks, you're swimming in these underground deep taverns in Florida, all of that. Very, very dangerous. And you're signing off a waiver before you even begin that, you know, you're not going to hold the place liable. So what if, you know, in that dark underworld, the, the dark web or whatever, there was this way um, that you could get people to come on these adventure vacations and someone was using it as a way to have people have accidents and die. And, you know, my co-anchor, this is during a two minute commercial, and his mouth drops open and he goes, oh, I would read that book. And I thought, oh, wow, that might be a good way, a good way to get men to read, you know, kind of a romantic suspense thriller is to put a lot of testosterone in it. So there is in this book, I mean, the main character is um, another under, undercover detective in he actually ends up going on this adventure vacation and the reporter um, continues to follow it as if she's just doing a story on the adventure vacation. And, you know, so there's a lot of really cool scenes flying in an F-16, which I actually have done before. So that that was from experience, um, you know, swimming with the sharks and uh, cave diving, all of that. And so it is kind of a testosterone fueled read. And I found that both men and women like women like it for that reason. Interesting. Yeah, that, that's funny that you you pitched it in two minutes to, <laughs> to your to your co-anchors. <laughs> I mean, that's the ultimate elevator right? pitch right there. Yeah, um, and he liked it. And so that's, you know, that is a good way to test your books out, I think. If I, if I were to give advice to a young writer, um, both younger in me in age and also in experience, I would say um, test your idea out on your friends, your elevator pitch. Because if it doesn't capture their attention in that, in that really quick elevator pitch, I'm not sure it's going to capture the attention of the reading audience as quickly as you'd like. You know, the, the competition is so fierce out there, especially with independent publishing. And anybody can, you know, publish a book these days that if your concept isn't pretty solid right off the get go, it's hard to even get anybody to read it. So you spend all this time, you know, writing a 400 page book. 
um, that isn't high concept. That's what my publisher all, always says to me. It's got to be high concept, Linda. But if I, I get what she's saying now, um, Liz Pelletier of Entangle, because if it's not high concept, uh, you know, you're not going to be able to tell people as quickly as I just did. And, you know, with the attention span of most people today, they just move on to something else. Yeah, we don't have terribly long attention spans anymore, do we? Not anymore, thanks to our phones and TikTok. Yes. <laughs> yes. So are you working on anything new currently? I'm working on all the missing girls. Um, it is the follow-up to all the broken girls. And it's going to take place in Cuba, which I'm really excited about. And there was a place that I visited in Cuba on one of my trips. And I've never been any place in the world like it. I don't want to give too much away. But I thought when I was trying to think of the second book, it would be such a unique backdrop for a murder mystery. And so I'm working on that. And then I'm also kind of working on a book with some of my friends called Chasing Bon Jovi. <laughs> and it's, um, you know, a group of friends, again, um, going on an 80s cruise ship, right, uh, with the goal of meeting Bon Jovi. It's kind of like um, the elevator pitch would probably be uh, like 80... Um, 80 for Brady uh, meets uh, what is, what is the Broadway play where they did all the eighties music? Um, oh, the, you know what I'm talking uh, about? Why can I not think of it? It was made into a movie, but it's one, the one where Tom Cruise played like he, he was like the guns and roses lead singer. Yeah, yeah, but I can't think so of it's kind of a mixture of that, you know, it's a friendship book and it's a comedy. Um, and it's, it's really the theme of it is about, you know, trying to recapture your, chasing your youth, you know, Bon Jovi was my youth. I grew up listening to, you know, their anthems as a teenager in the 80s. And you get to a certain age and you start reminiscing about the good old days, right? And we all at some point in our life chase our youth. And so that's what uh, this book is is about. Plus all the uh, fun hairspray moments you get. I mean, there's a lot of oh my gosh. in that book. <laughs> and, and if you, no, listen, if you were in the, if you grew up in the eighties, would you not go on a cruise if you had like Bon Jovi and Guns and Roses and, you know, all of those uh, poison, all of those, you know, sexy, long haired, leather wearing rock stars of, you know, MTV, that era, uh, if they were all on the same cruise ship and you could just go from deck to deck to deck and see concerts of your, you know, the favorite, uh, bands that you listen to growing up. I mean, I just thought that would be such a, a, a fun concept. But of course, each character is on the you know cruise for a different reason. And they all have their own emotional arcs that, you know, they they reach by the end of the book. But it's just kind of, a, I thought, a fun setting for a book about chasing your youth. And at the end of the day, you realize it's really the present that matters. Yeah. And um, it's a little more lighthearted than murder. Oh my gosh, yes. Yeah, every once in a while you have to step away from the stereo. <laughs> and the book, you know, my second, the, All the Missing Girls is, I know, going to be even darker because I'm not a dark person. I'm really not a dark person. But the people who have read the synopsis and my publisher, they're all like, oh, this is really creepy. So, I mean, I think it's even, it's even darker. <laughs> so, yeah, we'll see. <laughs> I, I want to go dark and then go light, you know? So you have to, it's, it's nice to have a balance of um, the two genres. <laughs> yeah, yeah final break of this episode when we come back linda will be talking about her favorite authors and genres so stay tuned you're listening to the gsmc book review podcast and i will be right back golden state media concepts sci-fi podcast together we dive into the world of sci-fi and science fiction from episodes of star trek star wars to the walking dead resident evil all the hot new science fiction movies from the back doors of marvel or dc the golden state media concepts sci-fi podcast you'll never look at science fiction the same way again Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and the conclusion of my interview with Linda Hurtado Bond. So in, in terms of balance and dark versus light, when you read for yourself, who are your go-to authors and genres? The kinds, well, 
let's see, romance. Um, you know, I'm, I'm big into Colleen Hoover right now. I know that that sounds kind of cliche to say, but I, I, st- I, I read one of her books only to see what all the fuss was about because I'm a writer uh, and because, she, you know, she's selling bukus of books. But I think she gets what I was talking to you about. She really gets to the heart of, um, um, she brings emotion to her characters and, and she makes it really universal what they're going through, whether it's surviving abuse or, you know, um, you know, looking for uh, trying, looking for a lost loved one. I mean, just whatever her theme is of the book, it's, they're pretty universal and she really touches the heart. Um, so I guess on the romance side, I would say I, I, I read that kind of book right now, but I'd really spend more time reading thrillers and, you know, so Harlan Coben, is is my ultimate favorite right now but every once in a while i just step out and uh and and read new authors because i just i just want to you know like flicker in the dark stacy willingham was um a university of georgia grad so i read that book because she was a uga grad it was great it was a serial killer book as well um and then i'll also read just a book that if it gets just great reviews like it's a recent book club you know I got to say, I think she does a really good job of picking great reads. Like where the crawdads sing would, would never probably be a book that I would pick up off the shelf because I'm a thriller girl, right? And a romance girl. And that doesn't say thriller or romance, but there is a murder mystery in it. Um, but it was fabulous. So I read that again because the author was from Georgia and because, you know, we, there were so many book clubs recommended it. So I, I don't really read a lot anymore, though. I'll tell you what I do. I listen to audio audiobooks. Because if I have downtime, I tend to want to be at my computer writing because I do have a day, a day job that, you know, is very time consuming. Uh, and my day job is not really nine to five. I do a lot with Fox out in the community, you know, making appearances and, and doing things. So uh, when I have spare time, I like to write on my own books. But how, how often are you in the car? Right. So I just throw mm-hmm. in an audible book and I'll listen. So that's really what I do now is I listen um, but and then I read Kelly Ripa's book lately too. Uh, I forget what the title was, but uh, it's the latest book by Kelly, and it was really funny. And that was just kind of a, you know, a, a grouping of essays about her life and funny things that have happened not only to her in you know business, but in her personal life. And I found it very ch- charming and funny, and I and very likable because she actually read the book, and I, I liked hearing about her life in her voice because it's her life. So I'll read a little bit of anything. But my go-to is probably thrillers because I just love a fast read, like a James Patterson. Um, I like to flip pages and I, and I like to, you know, something that I can get through rather quickly. Um, but American American Dirt was another book that really kind of blew me away. And that that book, that book, I don't know if you've read it or not, that book had me in the first seven pages. Like the first seven pages, I couldn't stop. So as a thriller writer, that's my goal. I like to try to hook my readers in the first seven pages. Like I want you to want to know what happens next. Mm -hmm. And when when we're talking with books, I'll just mention Lisa Kwan because you know, you're always, I think you're never too old or too good to learn and to get better. So she has a book out. It's a how to it, how to book on, you know, brains on story genius and wired for story, which, but what, what she basically is telling you is the brain science of reading and why some authors like James Patterson or um, Stacey Willingham can um, keep people burning pages. And it's because at the end of the day, we as human beings must know what happens next. It's very hard to walk away from a situation if you're invested without knowing what's going to happen next. So if you can end all your chapters that way with a big question mark and, oh, my God, what happens next? People will keep reading. And then I learned from James Patterson, if you keep your, um, not personally, <laughs> just by reading his books, if you keep your chapter short, right? Oh, it's only three more pages. I can read that. Oh, it's only five pages. I can read that. Oh, I got 20 more minutes. I'll read. You see what I'm saying? And so there's a mm-hmm. science to keeping people reading your story. So it's more, it's, it's more than just pretty words on a page. You know, there's actual science, I think, to writing a good thriller. It's not really our fault that we can't put the book down and go to bed. Right. It's your brain saying, yeah. don't you want to know what happens next? Exactly. We can just blame you. You think brain. you know what happens next, but is that really the case? You know, so if you can get people thinking that at the end of your chapters, um, then you're on to something. Yeah. Interesting. 
um, internet presence, website, and any social media that you're active on where people can find you? I think if you go to any social media and you Google author Linda Bond, you'll find me. Um, you know, I'm on TikTok. I, um, I'm on Twitter, author Linda Bond. Um, on Facebook, author Linda Bond. Instagram, author Linda Bond. Um, sometimes you'll see Linda Hurtado Bond because I, I wrote the last book under both names. But if you any if you Google author Linda Bond, my website is lindabond.com. Um, you'll find me. And I hope people will follow along and follow the adventure of the next book. Yeah. And actually, that explains a question I had about the dual last name versus the single last name. So thank you. Well, you know, Linda Bond was my romantic suspense. The three books I wrote for Entangle, Entangle the Live at Five, Flatline, and uh, Cube Undercover. So mm -hmm. I wrote those under Linda Bond. And because All the Broken Girls is a thriller, it's not a romance. I decided to put Hurtado in the middle. And also because it, I hoped that it gave it some ethnic um, credibility. Like I am writing about a diverse community and, and you know, my father is Hispanic. He's not Cuban, but I did marry a Cuban American. Uh, so, I, you know, that's, that's for the, the switch up of the names. Just, I want people to know when they pick up a book, what they're getting. Sure. Makes sense. Linda, we've covered a lot of different topics. Is there anything that we haven't talked about that you would like to highlight before our time is up? Gosh, you know, I just appreciate all the people that read and um, take the time to read my book. And I, if you follow my newsletter, which if you go to lindabond.com, there is a go to like uh, media or newsletter. You can sign up and follow my newsletter. But I, I, I'm very interactive and I really enjoy hearing feedback from my readers because, you know, I'm not writing for myself. I'm writing for th those who enjoy what I write. And I enjoy, it's the same thing kind of as being a television news reporter. I really kind of enjoy the interactive, um, you know, being interactive with the audience, whether the audience is sitting at home watching me on TV or the audience is, you know, sitting in their living room reading a book. And so the best way to interact with me is either on social media, because I do answer, um, you know, a lot of people on social media all, all the time, because these days we're always on social media. Uh, but also through my newsletter. And I think my newsletters are rather, they're not buy my book, buy my book, buy my book. I mean, I'll tell you on release day, hey, the book is out or, you know, pre-order day or something like that. But but usually it's full of different things like recipes, um, you know, chicken fricasse, that's a Cuban cuisine. Or uh, sometimes I'll interview other authors for my day job at Fox. And so I'll put interviews like with Nicholas Sparks on there or Kieran Slaughter. So it's kind of um, just a mixture of both of my careers. And uh, anything that I think that people who love to read books would love to read about, um, so it's not just me, 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 me. It's, it's, it really is like a variety of things. And so I just encourage, I want to thank my readers. First of all, I really, really appreciate you and encourage them to uh, follow me on social and sign up for my newsletter. Wonderful. Thank you for that. And also thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me about all the broken girls and writing. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. So nice talking with you. Thank you once again to Linda for taking the time to talk to me about this book and Mari and Santeria and all of the different things that we covered. I'm looking forward to hearing more of the story and uh, seeing what happens to some of the characters in this book in the next book in the follow-up. Um, something that I noticed as I was doing this episode, editing the interview, is that this is a little random. Bear with me. Um, I've I'm terrible. My Portuguese is terrible, but I am trying. We are learning. And in Portuguese, when there's an O on the end of the word, it's pronounced as an O. And I kept catching myself, and I don't think I caught all of them, saying hurtado uh, instead of hurtado. Uh, maybe you hear it, uh, but I definitely caught myself. In it. I, I, I sometimes read things with a Portuguese mindset now. Can't speak it to save my life, but uh, things are starting to stick. So maybe, maybe that's a good sign. At any rate, thank you very much to Linda for joining me. Thank you, as always, to you, my listeners, for joining me. If you are a fan of crime novels, if you're a fan of thrillers, if you like reporters who are investigating crimes that they maybe shouldn't be investigating, um, 
maybe you are from West Tampa and this will resonate with you. There's a lot of reasons that you can maybe check out this book. Um, but definitely if you are a thriller or crime novel fan, you should check out All the Broken Girls. Um, and then, of course, if you like it, tell your friends, leave a review, do all those wonderful things. And you know that that's leading me into saying if you are a fan of this podcast, well, first, if you're a fan of this podcast, you should join me for my next episode when a friend of mine will be joining me. She has written a book. Um, she's a former college basketball coach, and she has written a book. It is called I Love This Game, and her name is Elizabeth Romero Stanley, and I'm looking forward to talking to her uh, about this book, so join me for that. And then, again, if you're a fan of this podcast and you haven't done so already, here's the time where I say, please do leave a review, written or starred, whatever strikes you, it both help to get this out to more listeners. Um, also, like, subscribe, follow on whatever platform you listen to the podcast on. That will help you to know when there are new episodes out, especially like weeks like today, weeks like this, when we have more than one episode. They always come out on Tuesdays, but sometimes we have a bonus Friday episode, which is always fun. So do that. And then uh, I love to hear from you. So come find the podcast and me on social media. You can find the podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Love hearing from listeners. Again, hope you had a great week. Hope you have something going on this weekend that is restful, life-giving, energizing, whatever you need. I hope that that is what you will do. Um, but as always, I hope that no matter what you're doing this weekend or in the coming week, you have plenty of time to get yourself lost in lots of good books. Thank you so much. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from Movie to music from sports to entertainment and even weird news you can also follow us on twitter and on facebook thank you and we hope you have enjoyed today's program